You can't make something about us without us. This generation coming up, I feel like I learned so much from them because they're so bold about what they want, what they need, and they're unafraid. And I think it's partially because of how you've been able to grow up. You grow up in a multicultural landscape. Wow, this is great. Happy New Year, happy birthday. Look at you, look at all these people here. This is Sundance 2020, right? This is what it looks like. And so those of you who were here last year, we talked about the decolonization of documentary films. This year we're talking about looking forward, what are we gonna do in the next decade? And so I wanna give a shout out and a really big thanks for Cam and for Don for putting this together. We were talking about what are we gonna do at Sundance this year? And he goes, you know, what if we do something with like people who are actually doing something that are, as they call it, shouldering the future? And I think that was something we've been all talking about um, at the end of last year. Um, when you look back, I think a lot of people will look back at, like, say, 2018 as a banner year for Asian Americans. Yeah, Crazy Rich Asians was there. Um, uh, every, always be my baby. I mean, things like that. So 2018, 2019, we had the farewell. And then we saw something happen in 2019, too, in the Asian American film community. There were female directors, like Diane Paragus, that were, didn't come to Sundance, didn't go to South by Southwest, or the, but they came to the Asian American Film Festivals. And she ended up getting distribution from Sony. So... You know, for a while, a lot of our film festivals were being discounted by our own people. We understand that oh, we need to play to the, to the masses, but I think it's changing. And I think that's, that's the exciting thing about as we go into 2020. There's some kind of newness that's going on. There's some kind of feeling that's going on. I look at Paula, I look at her, because we've all been in the trenches a long time. Um, this is Sundance 21 for me. So when I came back in 2000, it wasn't this. But now it's this, you know? And it's great. And, you know, you guys all paid money to come here. It's not cheap to come to Sundance. So all I want to do is encourage you. You're here. You're obviously here because you want to be in film or you want to do something in film or be a content creator. Use this moment. Use this time and network with somebody. Don't just hang out at parties and receptions. Go meet somebody. I talked to somebody in here who's got three scripts and she's in a final section for AT&T and she's writing all these things. Those are the stories that next year or throughout the year we can be talking about and we can lift everybody and keep raising everybody up because that's what we have to do. Because if we don't, nobody else is going to, right? So think about all of you who are in the industry, who are quote unquote the gatekeepers. It's your opportunity to open that door. I call it the each one bring one. And if you can each one bring one, because the talent is there. And what I love about this new generation, y'all don't care. You're like, <laughs> I want to do what I'm going to do is what it comes down to. So I'm looking at who the people are on this panel. And I'm going to first introduce, I'm going to go in that order. So Effie T. Brown. <laughs> Let's bring her up. Come here, girl. Come here, right, right. Yeah, I think you, you will go right here. So Effie and I have been friends for a long time, but Effie's been in the fight for the longest time. Okay, don't make me sound old. No, no, we, well, I'm just, I'm just going to be dead. Like, I'm silly. No, here. but no, I the know, first Brad. time, I think the first time I came up here in 2000, and I was here with some film, uh, The Eyes of Tammy Faye. Yeah, I love And it. so, oh, right? yeah. we were hanging out as you, me, and Yvonne Welbin. Yes. Two black women and an uh, Asian fellow, and we were like busting oh, up, yeah. just cracking up and talking about production or whatever it was, but it was just kind of nice. And then people kept looking, who are these people? And then now I'm looking at, she's the CEO of Game Changer. So I, it's just like, no, we'll, we'll talk about that. So this is F.E.T. Brown. Have you see right there. All right. Oh, the birthday girl, Jean Chan. So Jean and I, we, we go way back. I work, this is like a church. This is a church, it's, sun, but it's Sunday. It's Sunday. Sunday is Sundance. But Effie, I mean Effie, Jean. We're so, we're so similar. 
Yeah, yeah, right. Jean has been this editor, and she's one of these people that always, in the same vein that you do, always brings people through. She doesn't even know that she's mentoring people in the editing space. And people all want to work. So this is Jean Chen, y'all. And last, but certainly not least, is someone that I just met today, Sharoom Kim. Please bring up Sharoom Kim, director of the original independent film in Netflix. We just met today, and we're going to know her for a long time. She's at, she's at Netflix. How long have you been in there? One year now, almost exactly. Right. There you go. So, so we want to keep Sharoom and Netflix so you all can get your stuff made over with that platform. So let's sit down and let's talk, okay? This is really kind of going to be a free-flowing kind of conversation. Again, the takeaway for all of us today is to go out and make your stuff, make your art. Because we need your stories. We need all of these stories. And this is an opportunity in 2020 and moving past 2020. Think about where you were. That's what we said like two years ago. 2018 was a banner year. And you said, we tell people, get up and do something and make something. Ramona, wait, wait I have to shout out. Ramona Diaz, come here. Oh. Stand up. Come here. I just saw you in the front. So Ramona Diaz. She's not scheduled. But no, but I just need to shout out. This is her third Sundance. She has a film that's here, you have to see it, and it's called A Thousand Cuts, and it's about Maria Reza, uh, who is the founder of Rappler, and these people that are doing, they're doing things where they're, they're, they're challenging free speech in the Philippines, and their president, who acts like a dictator like some of our own, <laughs> is, is really like, and they, the, the people that you bring to the table are people what I call that are that are making change. These are the change makers. But Ramona, this is her third Sundance. I just wanted I, I just saw her sitting in the front, so I just want to shout her out. So thank you. And I've known David for so long. Yeah, he we've been share, so, yeah, yeah. Good. All right. So I'm gonna start with you, Effie. I want you to um, I'm ready. <laughs> I want you to do you have a I'm pass it. Yeah. Are you we all have? Oh, we have, we okay, have. great. I want you to talk about your background, where you came from. What made you How much time go do into we have? this? <laughs> like, we got to take all the time, time you need. No, oh. no this is our, the, so you guys know, this is our panel. We're here till 1.30. We're going to talk. We want you guys to ask questions Excellent. as it comes up. So, but talk about where you came from, because I think it's important to know where you were to where you are. And if, I'll try to be brief. No, 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 don't be so brief. So I just want to share. I'm like, if you have, know how much wait, I can go on HBO if you haven't and look up Project Greenlight. What year? Uh, what year? Was it 2016 or 20? 20, it was like, close. Like, I look at Paula, I'm like this, like, when was that? I'm coming oh, no. Right? So she, she took <laughs> people to task about diversity. Oh, yeah. She had to educate and people. Oh, and Matt I think Damon. his name was Matt somebody? Mr. Damon. Matt Damon. Mr. So Damon. if you guys take a look, if you have HBO, go back to HBO, go someplace like that. But anyway, Effie, it's yours. No, I just want to say thank you so much for asking me, and it's such a uh, such a pleasure to be here. I always love to talk to the peoples. You know what I mean? It's like, it's always so good. Um, so I mean, just really quickly, a little bit. Um, I call like my what and my why. You know, um, I grew up in New Jersey. Um, you know, I think that felt exactly Jersey, and I, you know, and um, and I think that you know we go into film and television either for escape or for connection. And as a kid growing up, I never, I was sort of going into it for escape because I didn't see anyone that looked like me. I didn't see, you know, or if I did, we were, you know, it was not like the best representation. And, um, and that's what really moved me. But I always had to do something that I think a lot of us know, which is called code switching, where we always had to be like, well, I'm going to take off my being a little black girl in New Jersey, and I'm going to go be Boss Hog or, you know, Dukes of Hazard. You know what I mean? To go and be somebody else, like the TV shows, and to live through, you know, their heroic story. And I didn't have one of my own necessarily to go to. And that's what sort of drove me. That and Alien. Um, you know what I mean? I never did, weren't expecting that segue, huh? Right. <laughs> So anyway, no, but like I remember seeing Alien as a kid, and it was like the first time I actually got to see a woman save herself, right? Think about it, you know? And also, she was in charge. Her boss overrode her and made the wrong decision, and she had to, like, clean it up, right? Remember that? The black guy, Yafit Koto, got to live almost to the end, you know, of the movie. It's, you know, but I mean, I'm not, I mean, it's funny, but, like, these are the things, I don't know, like, I mean, I'm a little older than some of you, but, like, this is the stuff that we remembered and like that that I you know that moved me I love the fact that in that movie 
It was multicultural, you know, it was diverse. Like, you know, Gothic Cotto's best friend was Harry Dean Stanton, who was sort of like a good old boy trucker, and they were besties. Anyway, it moved me, you know what I mean? And that's when I realized, when I saw that, I was like, oh, wait, there is a different paradigm. Like, we can do something that we can be our own hero, and we can see ourselves differently. And then that's what's really what spurred, you know, my... I'm like cut to, I'm like, I'm 48. I can't go through all the years. But like, that's what spurred, you know, me on to like wanting to make movies because for me, I couldn't be it if I couldn't see it. You know what I'm saying? And images are really important. And, um, and that's what drove me. And I also think like another one, I just like, because we might remember, remember John Hughes? Do you remember like, uh-huh, uh-huh. But remember like, we used to like, I remember being a kid and being, we were so hungry for seeing different representations. Like, you know, we would, took, we would take the ones that were, like, cause it's problematic. If you think about John Hughes now, we were like, that was super, I mean, black folks weren't even there. You know what I mean? Like, at least like you guys were there. You know what I mean? Like, but like, you don't want to be there, but like we weren't even, he never, he never saw us. You know what I mean? So like, those are the things like seeing us, not seeing us, seeing us represented in correctly was what made me want to go into film. What was the first project that you did and how did you get that? Uh, the first project that I did, you know, I'll be real, I worked my way up through the ranks. You know what I mean? Like, I came up as a PA, PA to coordinator, coordinator to manager, manager to line producer, line producer to producer to EP to now CEO. Um, you know, I was But you know what I mean? But like that's, but like that was, it was, a, it was a trajectory, but like I actually, I had to go to a community and I had to get support and I went to a place called Film Independent and I was a part of Project Involved. That was what, like, that's what gave me my start, you know? And I got a mentor named Lori Parker who taught me how to be, who really taught me how to be a good producer. And her thing was, um, you know, she taught me the lesson of, hey, Effie, because I used to think that, like, I'm gonna be bigger than Oprah Winfrey and Jerry Bruckheimer. And she was like, oh my God, that's cute. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, you're a black girl, and it's like, okay, girl, that's okay. You know, and so she taught me, she said, look, I believe that you're gonna make it, and I'm gonna help you try to make it. But when you make it, you're gonna look to the left and to the right of you, and you're gonna see that the biggest lie that they tell us is that there's room for only one of us. And you're going to look up and you're going to say, oh, wait, there was space for more of us. And as I am helping you, Effie, it is your job on your way up to put your hand back and bring up others because that's the only way that you make it. And that was Lori, pa I'm telling you, that was Lori Parker. And she taught me that when I was doing Project Involved and I think I was 21. And she got me young. She taught me right. And that's what I do today. And that's what I try to bring to others. So when we were talking about Project Greenlight, what was... I want to bring that up only because okay. for all of us that had watched Project Greenlight prior mm -hmm. to, we never saw a person of color in, in Project Greenlight. Mm -mm. And so when you came or on. Or a woman, practically. Or a woman, be exactly. Yeah. But so when you came on, we were like, okay, well, one, I knew you, and I said, like, let's see what she's going to do. But what I loved was the fact that you were so raw and you didn't hold back, where I think some people would have held back. Can you talk about that experience and like yeah. being there and what that was like and when they first came to you or you were chosen? to be But here's the thing Greenlight. like this is where it's so just really quickly about Project Greenlight and this is like a lot of you how many of you in this audience are producers Okay great so I'm a producer by trade and a lot of times when you do independent film, you don't get paid and you, or you underpay yourself because as producer, we are the first ones to give up our fees. And at the time of Project Greenlight, and I'll say this, and I believe in talking numbers and I believe in transparency. I did a movie called Dear White People and I made $40,000 over two years. I'm a grown ass woman, right? Do you know what I mean? Like $40,000, $20,000 a year, I was almost about to lose my house and I was about to get my car, I was about to repossess. And then when HBO came to me, and these are the decisions that you make when you're, you know, out of fear and desperate. Thank you, Paula. Paula's like, desperate. I'm like, yes, girl, desperate. <laughs> when you're desperate, I said, yeah, because I needed to get out of debt. And at that time, I heard what I wanted to hear, which was like, you're not going to be on camera, girl, because it was just beautiful. There was this other guy that was supposed to be like the lead, and I was just going to get paid to produce the movie, which is what I do all the time in HBO. I love them. They pay well. But I got jacked on this, right? So anyway, so um, I was like, so, um, and then it just became um, obvious. But I made that decision because I needed to get out of debt and I needed to be able to live. That was my truth. So my, the message of that is pay yourself and make sure that you take care of yourself first. And as for Project Greenlight, when it became very apparent that um, 
people didn't see the things the way that we see. Like we always think that, I'll, I'll talk for myself, I think that everyone sort of comes from an inclusive or diverse mindset. But you know what? A lot of people don't. And it's not because they don't like us, it's because they don't ever have to. They live in that white privileged world. You know, and I coming in there and then seeing that they didn't want, it was a woman and a Vietnamese director who were, to me, were the clearly the best. And it became apparent that they didn't want to talk to them or talk about them. They were really adamant about these young white guys. And then that's when the comment came up from Mr. Damon saying, we're not going to, um, you know, uh, we're not going to be diverse for diversity's sake, Effie. If you want to be diverse, it's in the casting of the, it's in the casting, not behind the scenes. And literally, and like Ben Affleck was, it was like really, you know, it's, you can watch it, it was real, but you have that moment when you're just like, oh shit. <laughs> you're like, okay, this is really happening right now. And I thought of my ancestors, and I mean that. I thought of my ancestors, and I thought of the women in my family who were like, you talk and argue all the time. This is the appropriate place to bring it up. But it's intimidating because you're with like one percenters and superstars. And at that time, you know, I was trying not to lose my house, right? So I'm grateful that I, you know, I was, I call it a God shot that I had like the ancestors, my hair, you know, they all came like, speak. And I was able to say, you know what I mean? But like, but that was true. But also again, you know, code switching again, if you guys ever watched that, I was like, wow, okay, all right. You know, when, you have to, when someone says something so offensive where you want to be like, what? But you can't because like you're on camera, right? So I was like, okay, wow, okay. And then you have to sort of come at it. And I'm grateful that it worked out but it didn't necessarily work out. Black Twitter and the, the people came and like, you know, held me up when that came out. And that's the truth because I couldn't get hired after that. I couldn't get hired. The people loved, like, you know what I mean? Power to the people, but the white, you know, people who had the purse strings, the studios and all that were not trying to mess with me because I was confrontational. You're I was deemed as aggressive and all of that good yeah. stuff. So, and my last night I want to shut up and move on, but like, it was Lee Daniels. And this is really important too. I think it's really important for people to realize that you know, to a closed mouth doesn't get fed. And that there's gonna be some people that are in positions of power that can help you and how important it was, because he helped me. Because he called me up and was like, girl, you let those white boys have it. And you know what I mean? And I was like, I, was like, I didn't mean to, Lee. I just tried, I gotta find a job. And he said, and he was like, come work for me. He said, come work, swear to God, he said, come work for me. And I went and worked for him. And that was how I became executive producer of Star because of that. So, <laughs> to Lee Daniels. <laughs> no, but also to you, oh but also to you, got, you had that conversation started, you know, and I think, you know and, and at the end of the day, he had a, not just himself, but everybody else that was associated that watched that had that had to like take that into account what you had said and i think that's and that started that whole conversation with then then the d word came up every every oh, year explaining yeah but you know what's but, but it was diversity, like diversity but you know what's that also was, interesting yeah. i don't know oh, damon's not the Damon, that Damon. too the but, it was, but it's interesting but like at the end of the day though like like i've never heard from them since like you know what i mean like one of them won an oscar for green book you know what i mean but, okay but didn't they call you know what you? i mean no, they never, I never, I never got a call, but like, I never get anything, you know, and who cares? Like, I'm better for it and everything is fine. But it's interesting to talk about when you, I, I want to be clear, like when you do speak truth to power, there are some repercussions. You do have to sort of weigh, you know, make sure that you're, you're ready to handle it. But yeah. Well, that's the thing. That's what I like, we said this cam forward, 40 yeah. years of stories that move. Like you were saying, truth to power and speaking. What I like about this new generation of content creators, they're just speaking. I know. And they're doing, I'm you know, you guys jealous. are doing your thing. So it's great that we need, you know, we do that you're doing that. I want to move on to Gene, because Gene has been in the trenches on the documentary world. And you've worked with a lot of different directors. She and I just finished working on The Apollo, about the Apollo Theater yeah. with Roger Ross Williams. Yeah. And he's another one, I think, that gives in terms of a director and lets you do what you need to do. Can you talk about also, like, how we had, if you talk about your, your start, your origins, where you came from. You know, when we were doing press for the Apollo, you were talking about how the Apollo was in the, your neighborhood where you went to school. Um, but talk about, you know, where you came from and what brought you here and, and to be this master editor 
Well, thank you very much. First, I have a question for the audience. How many of you are immigrant in this audience? Please raise your hand. Wow. This is beautiful to see. So I was born in Taiwan and came to America when I was 11 years old, moved to the Bronx uh, in 1972. So you know what that was like. And so I didn't know I was a POC, people of challenge, um, oh. back then. First, you have to the challenge of language. I knew 26, 24, 26 alphabets. I can't even remember. Look anyway, at me. So I'm like, I don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, first obstacle was learn the language. Mm -hmm. Also, I actually didn't know I was poor because the reason we immigrated, my father was bankrupt. I didn't even know that. So we have all these obstacles. And I think, um, I just want to quote, by the way, I'm an editor and I have just, uh, I'm not a chronological person, so I go bouncing back and forth, just bear with me. I just want to quote uh, a wonderful quote in our Asian American series by Jerry Yang. He was also an immigrant. And he said, when your back is against the wall, the only way is to move forward. Mm. So, and I realized that was my experience. Mm -hmm. So their origin story, so you know, um, I was in the Bronx, and the problem is my academic was terrible. I'm not a model minority. <laughs> I was, I'm actually uh, proven I really am the bottom 2%. <laughs> um, so, but you know, I always have the passion for art. So I was very lucky. I, in New York City, the specialized high school, the LaGuardia High School, uh, which was the fame school. So I went there for fine art. And that's actually where I learned English and storytelling. When you, when you have great teachers in your life and you, know, you have to read all the books and, and a great teacher can change your life. So I say, I wanna be a storyteller. And so I applied for NYU Film School. So, and I, at that time, I was probably the only Asian American in the undergrad. And there, I actually had a fortune to meet Ang Lee. Uh, he was in the grad school. I was going there to actually, I want to be a camera woman. This is back in the sev uh, 70s, 1979. And in the summer of 82, my junior year, I went across country uh, with a film crew, all Chinese crew. I was the assistant camera, Ang Lee was the sound man. We didn't know what we were doing, so that was the very first documentary I ever worked ever worked on. Jenna Yang was the producer. Yes, and uh, after five weeks of really hard work, I said, this is not for me. <laughs> and I have to, it was my last year in college. I was really lost, so I took an editing class with a legendary Paul Barnes who's been editing for Ken Burns for the past 30 years. And one night he showed, uh, D.D. Allen's uh, edit is Bonnie and Clyde. And I was just blown away that you can tell story through editing. And I say, I think I want to do that. Mm. I didn't know that's a possibility at the time. So on my test, I just wrote to Paul. I say, if you know anyone who's looking for an intern, please let me know. So that was 1982 uh, winter, and Sally Menke called me. Oh, wow. I don't know you know Sally Menke. She's legendary editor for Quentin Tarantino. And so I was an intern for two years, no money, you know, and I pay my dues. I was an assistant for nine years altogether. And, you know, also I didn't want to uh, pigeonhole myself into a particular kind of documentary, so I really worked with a lot of many different um, editors. I was an assistant. And this is when a mentor is so important. Sally basically showed me the way, I mean, laid a foundation, and Larry Silk, another legendary editor who's cut like three Oscar-winning film, he was like my father, editor, mentor, and he really showed me the way. And that actually, that art is being lost right now, that you don't have the assistant editor, editor relationship in the cutting room. And a lot about editing is not about the technical stuff. It really is about um, the diplomacy, in the cutting room, it's about life. And so he was my mentor, and I was just really lucky. I worked with the top people in the business. My first job, um, I was assisting editing for Emma Jo Morris, and she, her first film was at Sundance in 1993. She asked me to uh, 
edit it because you know she originally she was gonna edit it and she gave it to me. And it won three awards. I was just really lucky. That was my first Sundance, 1993. I wasn't here until 97. And then during that time, I was called to work on a film, Malcolm X, Make a Plane, for American Experience in Boston. Orlando Bagwell called me. Um, you know, something I learned about editing is about trust. So I really didn't have much under my belt, and it was a really big film at, in, back in 1992. And I actually didn't know in the middle of the film, I was almost getting fired, because when the film's not working, I think the editor gets blamed, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's like, if the film is great, the editor, you know, it's okay, but when the, the director, director, the director did it. Yeah. But, but this is what, you know, a great trusted director, it just, you know, he just basically let me finish. And also that's the time I learned a big lesson about confidence, finding my own voice. So before then, actually, you know, being an immigrant, I could not get rid of my accent. And to this day, I brace my Chinese accent. Because there was, <laughs> when I was an assistant editor, there was another very famous director, I won't mention his name, part of PBS. He was questioning my accent. Oh yes, and I say, okay, you know, this is another lesson I learned being an immigrant, I observe. And I see what to do and what not to do. And this is what I pass on to my you know, my assistant editors, my people. It's, I believe in karma. <laughs> and I also believe in ancestors and angels. When your intention is right, the angels will be around to help you through it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's like when you're in desperation, I, this is, there's always one way to move forward. Yes. And I forgot the rest. <laughs> oh, the Apollo? <laughs> but is, there, is there a project that was one that you really felt where you had like this awakening, like this is what I'm going to do? Wow, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> one project, I... It could be more than one, but I mean, was there that moment where you had that epiphany and said, okay... It's not actually what I'm going to do. It's actually, I have to say, who inspired me, a film. Uh, when I was in college, I saw Arthur Dung's short film, Sewing Woman. It's a 13-minute short documentary about his mom. And it was very simple. It's all shot with MOS, you know, just film with no sound. And with a narrator, it was actually an actress. And that 13-minute really just blew me away, the power of documentary and of a short film. In 13 minutes, could be that powerful. And I said, that's what I really wanted to do. Um, but um, every film I embrace, I actually also, not being very smart, in, you know, in academically, every film I come on board, for me, it's a master class. I, I learn, I'm, I'm always learning. I, I think this is why I love editing. Every job is a learning experience. And I, the Apollo film, yeah. it's also, you know, being um, at the fame school, and the school is really literally 10, minute, 10 blocks away from the Apollo Theater. And a lot of my friends, were, you know, in, for a part-time job, they were seat warmers. And, just, uh, and then to, be, to work on the film, to be in the, the theater, it was a church. And to stand on the stage where all the great legend has been, it, it was just, you know, it was just great. I mean, that was 85 years that you guys put down into like an what an hour and a half, 94, 94 minutes. Yeah, that's a tight. 90. I mean, and, and that's the that's you as the editor. Even Roger has said that that the story was coming out of the editing room with, with you, you know, with you being at the helm, looking at that from that story. Did, was that something telling that story, working together with him, but utilizing things that are in the back of your head and what your background has been, even as like immigrant or living there, did that really play into what you were doing with that particular film? Well, actually, you know, I, I went to one of the Q&A and someone was asking me, uh, when you edit, do you edit from the emotional space or intellectual space? Mm -hmm. And I actually realized I don't really have, don't have that much of intellectual space. <laughs> <laughs> so my answer is always emotional, right? But, and then what was so great about working as editor, 
I mean, when the director goes out, they go out for the best people in the world. So what you, del what you get, the ingredients, the, 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 the super intellectuals, and all I do read, this is also being part of the immigrant experience, I think. When you learn how to speak English, you pick up what you need mm -hmm. to get by, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and also short attention span. So I, I think just by working, I mean, the, all the years, you can make it perfect. You can make people talk perfect. Even I, I you can see, I really don't talk perfectly. Um, so that, that's just one of the joy. And, and also, I love music. You know, I grew up in the 70s, so Motown music, the soul, the, you know, it's just to work through the 85 years of history of music. And also, one thing, being an immigrant from Taiwan, I didn't know about racism and civil rights movement in America. Mm. You know, even in school, it wasn't really taught, you know? So I mean, it was just a few years after the civil rights bill was signed. And I also had the privilege to um, work at Blackside with Malcolm X, who made the most amazing, I think, um, Ice on a Prize series. That was yeah. you know, just the most amazing thing. And so when working with Roger, he said the most important thing from the film, even though it's a music history, it's the politics and race. I actually did not think about my identity as an Asian American until I work on Renee Tajima's film, My American, in 1995. I felt I was more African American black because I grew up in Harlem. I, I went to school in Harlem. Most of my friends are African Americans. And I worked on Scottsboro Boys, Malcolm X. I was black film editor than before I was an Asian American filmmaker. And, and until 1995, you know, I said, oh, I'm an Asian American. <laughs> That's all right. Because I, I really call myself an immigrant until now. Yes. Uh, no. That's and Sharoon, would you give us the background of yes. you know where you've been, where you are now? And Absolutely. I mean, first of all, I honestly, hearing you guys speak, I just I feel like honored to be a part of the audience. Like, I want to ask you a bunch of questions now, but now I've got to talk about myself, and that's going to be way more boring. So, <laughs> But um, I grew up in Seattle, Washington. I was the child of two immigrants from Korea. And frankly speaking, I always loved entertainment, and I always loved movies. I always felt like it was kind of a the thing, my, my home was a little bit different from most of my friends at school, but the things we could always connect on were films. Um, but growing up as an Asian American immigrant, I don't know if you guys have had this experience. Interestingly enough, as an adult, I've learned that my dad's whole side of the family had these like strong artistic yearnings and they all got shut down. They're like engineers and they're, you know, and, and it actually creates a lot of dysfunction. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but that was something that was always in me, but I just never thought that there were jobs uh, that I could do in this industry. So I actually uh, went to visit USC as a junior in high school, and I fell in love with it. And I thought, you know what? I can go to USC, and I can be an entertainment lawyer, not knowing what that meant, not understanding. I see London, who's in our uh, business affairs group, not understanding that that's really just contracts. And I feel so blessed that I went to that university and was able to, um, I ended up minoring in film. And I got to see that there were so many different jobs in this industry. And um, I sort of went a traditional executive route. I in college, interned at the agencies and production companies. Then I did my year at William Morris as an agent trainee. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> and then I went on and sort of uh, grew up and was raised through the Warner Brothers system. I launched a company with Bradley Cooper. Uh, American Sniper was the first film we did together. And um, then uh, when STX was forming, uh, yeah, uh, I went over with Adam Fogelson and Oren Aviv and started the film group with them. And throughout this time, I will tell you, I remember I, I thought about this quote throughout my career. Condoleezza Rice always said if she waited for a mentor to look like her, she'd be waiting forever. Yeah. So up until this point in my career, which was only a year ago, I only worked for privileged white men. 
And what that did to my belief in what I could push forward is so detrimental. You know, I think there was a lot that I learned from them that I really, really appreciated and that I can take and apply to my career now. But the messages that I got constantly, I remember, gosh, it was less than a decade ago, I was talking to one of my bosses about representation. At that time, I didn't even have the term representation. You know, it was just about making sure that we had equal representation on screen. You know, I, I, I was really fumbling to try to have this conversation with him, and he just shut it down. He said, it's an emotional argument, I get it, but it's not really logical. And that was that. And um, up until two years ago, when we got Crazy Rich Asians and To All the Boys in one weekend, it was the first time we had a choice where we could see ourselves on screen in a real way. Um, I, was, I was so moved to tears, actually. The, I went to a screening of Crazy Rich Asians, and I couldn't believe we weren't doing more of this, you know? And I had a little taste of it through really an ally, um, you speak to the John Hughes movies, which we all grew up on, and uh, I love teen films. Uh, it, it really helped me through my high school years, and, and, and I make a lot of them, I work on them now. Um, but Kelly Freeman Craig and Jim Brooks, I worked on Edge of Seventeen with them. Oh, that was great, yeah. Yeah, and Kelly just wrote Irwin Kim as a Korean American boy, and there was never a question, there was never a reason. She just thought this character should be Erwin. And it was so heartening to go to the test screenings where there were boys that looked like traditional heartthrobs, like what we have seen on screen. And um, the test audiences and the focus groups and all of the cards that Erwin Kim was so hot that they wanted like more shirtless <laughs> scenes with him. And, and, I <laughs> and that was the first time I realized it was so, I feel so honored to be a part of a movie that like in what in generation these teen movies went from Long Duck Dong yep. to Erwin Kim. Yep. And I'm so thankful that we are all working here now and we can do that. Like I look at all these faces here and I see people who are creatives and they have a voice and I want to be a part of encouraging that voice and making sure that those things continue to happen. And I just have to tell you in my year at Netflix, uh, I've really got to experience that. I went in knowing that I would be taking over the To All the Boys franchise, and um, the second movie is releasing uh, February, February 12th, excuse me, on Netflix, so everyone check it out. But yeah, and it's really, it's really Jenny Han um, and her story and her courage and her bravery, much like everyone here, to tell their story and to um, be authentic. Uh, she really crafted such an incredible character that I feel like means a lot to Asian American women, but I think young women everywhere, and maybe hopefully a couple of young men as well. Uh, look, my, <laughs> my question of that was, was she include an Asian American man or boy into this too? Because that was the thing that I felt was missing. I looked at it, I celebrated her, I celebrated Lana, and I suppose well, something's missing here, and as an Asian American, I know I'm, maybe I'm not supposed to talk about that, but that was the thing that missed for me. I liked it, I liked where it was going, and I was hoping that in number two, and I don't know if you can talk about that, that she, there would be that portion of that. No, thank it? you for asking that question, yeah. because I agree. I think that representation is not just about putting people on screen, but also having um, that counterbalance of representation that we haven't seen, and, um, and maybe I'm taking it a step too far to say that I, I don't think, I think Asian men have been under sexualized and Asian women have been over sexualized in media and that needs to change. So when we were casting um, the second lead to uh, uh, to all the boys it, uh, without giving away too much of the plot. So <laughs> no spoilers there. It, there's a little bit of a love triangle and uh, the casting, we went really wide and we ended up casting this incredible actor named Jordan Fisher. He's African American and he is unbelievable. There was nobody else that could have played that role. Um, but in casting the rest of the roles, we really did want Asian representation. So we, uh, had Ross Butler play Noah Centineo's best friend. And frankly, 
I know that Jenny and I have had a lot of conversations about this on a personal level. I always tell Jenny, I wish she was around when I was a little girl so I could have read her books. And But I'm so glad that we're friends now and that she's making change. And she's learning constantly, um, as are we. So we really want to include um, great... Uh, Asian American, not only women, but men, and have role models for boys to look up to. And I can't speak to a project quite yet. I'm working on a deal with a project that will have two Asian American leads, and it's a romance geared directly towards teens. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you mentioned like Edge is 17, right? And then you had Hayden pop in there, and all of a sudden, all the all, all kids were like, who is this hot boy? <laughs> you know, they weren't saying, who is this hot Asian boy? They were like, who is this hot boy that was there Haley Stansfield that fell in love with? Or was like... Hayden Zeto. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but who, who was the, the lead woman? The oh, girl? Uh, Haley, Haley Steinfeld, Steinfeld, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, there, so I thought that was... Because no one, like, said, wow, this is happening. We have to celebrate it. It just was there. Mm -hmm. And it's like there was no explanation, and I think that's the part that I really appreciated about that about that film. In, and as we look at, and you're working with a lot of younger people telling stories, do you feel, I'm just thinking of this newer generation where uh, multicultural is really who they are, you know, because a lot, there's a lot of that. And I, it was really interesting watching, just watching like ads on TV, and everything is so mixed race. Back in the 70s, you yeah. wouldn't have that. My mother would be calling people on, on the phone. She was, did you see that commercial? There's, you know, there's an Asian woman, and then she's washing clothes. And all her sisters would look for it. I mean, because we were they're so hungry to see, them, see ourselves on the screen. But I think you're in a landscape where you're looking at what the newer generation, what um, the new market is looking at. I look at something that's on HBO, like Euphoria, mm -hmm. which I'm a super fan of. Call me sick, but it was like, whoa. <laughs> But they had so many different people that were so mixed on not just race, but everything, LGBTQ, XYZ, ABC, and they had it all. But so are you seeing trends like that? Is that something that, I don't know if you can speak to that, that you guys are looking for, like at Netflix? Absolutely. I think it's kind of a core tenant for us to make sure that we are making films that reflect everybody's experience and that every story feels worthy and that people feel like they can see themselves on screen, whatever that means for them. And to your point about this new generation, yeah. it's interesting, we talked a lot about who's inspired us along the way, and I've definitely been inspired by the people that came before me, but really, I don't know if you guys feel this way, this generation below us coming up, I feel like I learned so much from them because they're so bold about what they want, what they need, and they're unafraid. And I think it's partially because of how you've been able to grow up. You grow up in a multicultural landscape, and to them, seeing Haley Steinfeld and Hayden is not a thing. Seeing Noah Centineo and Lana, seeing multicultural relationships, um, that's that's their every day, and they want to see their every day represented. Um, they're also proud of who they are. Uh, one of the reasons why I really want to have more representation of Asian American culture is that, again, I grew up in a community where I wasn't surrounded by a lot of Asian Americans. So I remember feeling, and I hate saying this now, it's embarrassing to admit, but that I felt shame sometimes when my mom made like food that smelled really bad or like, you know? And then the opening scene of To All the Boys, um, John Corbett is trying to make Korean food downstairs. And even things like that make us feel more proud early on. I feel like I'm gaining a sense of pride now in my adulthood, and I want that to start at a very young age for people. Yes. 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 And, and when you said that, I talk, think about, was it always be my maybe? Yeah. And it's the young girl who goes next door to the Korean family, and then she's just cutting everything. And it's like, it was that moment. And it's like, like you said, I think a lot of Asian younger people were like are ashamed of like, oh, you know, they make fish in my house or something like that. But then here she goes, and they embraced it throughout the whole thing. Or of course, then she's a chef, right? And, yeah. and she does all that. But I think like, so even small things like that where it's representation of it from the culture is actually very important. And then all of a sudden, you know, Bim Bim Bop is like super famous. <laughs> you know, Pad Thai is now, you know, super, I mean, so you see, and Shirach is a thing. You know, it's so all it's delicious. A, it's, it's I don't know what we were thinking. <laughs> right. You know, um, 
Let's pause for a moment. Let's take some questions from the audience. I think we've been doing a lot of talk. Uh, raise your hand for anybody. Uh, how about you? Yeah, stand up. It's, this is incredible. So one, I also consider myself an immigrant and not necessarily Filipino, um, which is a really hard thing to do. But one of the things that I was, no, a hard, hard thing to reconcile, okay. right? Um, <laughs> Hard thing to write, because I'm a little nervous, sorry. Um, so my question is, you, you know, we had a conversation this morning with um, one of my new friends who I met earlier um, this week, and she brought me to the Black House. The first event I did was at the Black House. It was incredible, full of community. Everyone won at the screenwriter panel. I was crying, everyone was amazing. And my question is, um, she didn't know that the last black man in San Francisco was by a white director. and. I haven't seen it because of that, because I saw the director um, interviewed and I didn't like his energy. Now, as a producer myself, I was sorry, like, Damn. that's just okay. my, that's my subjective. <laughs> that is my subjective, it was I'm completely sorry. subjective. Okay. And, and it's really hard to like understand that, right? So now as a producer, and actually my director is white, a white male. Uh, for uh, do you a, like his energy? His yeah, energy I do okay. love his energy and he's incredible. I'll tell Joe. Right, and right, I actually go. told him, I said, you have to pay me for this because otherwise I'd be doing it for myself. And so, and he, he did, we put a contract together and he's an incredible human being. So my question is, how do you navigate around that when you know you are a, um, you want diversity, but then sometimes, you know, you're surrounded by 86% of Hollywood directors are white men. How do you navigate through that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to clarify. <laughs> I know I, you said a lot and it was I'm fabulous. sorry. <laughs> I just said a lot. <laughs> but I'm curious, are you trying to, uh, what exactly are you trying to navigate finding qualified people of color to direct? Yeah, or like, you, you know, or even kind of spreading the word. I right? was like, for, I'm like, we're every, are, are y'all not here? No, <laughs> like, exactly. Like, we're everywhere. Yeah. Or spreading the word or kind of just kind of guiding, you know, other people with stories they want to tell, maybe writers of color, women of color who have stories to tell. And maybe they, they just want, like, maybe this is a break if they're, you know, sure. how I do you navigate I, that? I completely understand because we have this all the time, Arabella, it's sort of, we want to be able to tell our stories, right? Representation is not just about what's in front of the camera. There has to be an authenticity. There has to be, I know that oftentimes when, if you look back at the 90s and there's like a female driven movie, you can always tell when it was written by a man, by the way the woman behaves and the yeah. things that she does. So. I think that it's twofold. We have to be building up our networks and working together and making sure that people are empowered um, to tell their stories and that needs to be a goal. I also think we need to have uh, an opportunity to have that uh, conversation about allyship because white men in power are not necessarily the enemy they don't necessarily know all of the experiences that we have and we need to be open to having those conversations and, and we need to have people who have really listening ears on our side as well. Right. But I just want to make sure, are you, I just want to, I totally, I echo and I absolutely agree and affirm everything that you're saying, but I guess maybe I was a little unclear. You're trying, are you looking for people or are you trying to get the word out? Because you have to be advocates, right? Well, that's what I exactly. Okay. And also, for me, I am looking for more female DPs, female of color DPs. Because well, there's definitely organizations. Just to sort of speak to that, there's definitely organizations that like Film Independent. You also have Sundance is also a great resource as well. But and there's also the JTC list. There's there's quite a few, and there's it's. Sorry, I just want to. A docs. They're like there's. Yeah, there's like there's. Well, and also you have Cam in San Francisco. Exactly. Oh, that. Thank I mean, you. So you live yeah. there. I think you can really tap into yeah. your resources, like you were said. There's so all project sorts involved. of resources. Yeah, and I feel and I feel like cause I. I a little bit of a conversation. Like I found like maybe I got a little hemmed up a little bit on what you were saying before because it's really interesting. I have a saying and I believe you can't make something about us without us. Mm -hmm. I agree with that and I'm actually very hardcore about it. But then there's always exceptions to the rule and maybe because I'll just say last black man in San Francisco, I would urge you to see that movie because it's spectacular. And the fact that there's a, uh, he did have a lot women of color as his producer, 
he actually lived that. I mean, I, I'm saying like he lived that experience. There's an authenticity that I can give. Like it's interesting to say I can give it a pass. There's other movies that are out there now. This is going out live that I won't say, but um, huh. that are like that's being touted by A-list actresses that are probably going to be nominated for an Academy Award, but were directed by a guy. You know what I'm saying? You can do like I can talk about Green Book, and I'll feel comfortable talking about Green Book. But you know what I mean? I'm talking about, but I don't care. I'll take that hit. You know what I mean? But you're talking about, but that's where to me it was inauthentic. So I do think it's a bit of a fine line that we need to walk, and allyship is very important, but also you know having that. Um, integrity of story and cultural specificity is really important, but we're out there. And that's why I want to make sure like we're absolutely out there. The lists are out there. The resources are out there. And the thing that we have that a lot of other folks don't is that we talk to one another. Right. You know what I mean? Like we know where a good sale is. We know where the hottest record is. We know where people are. We got to open up our mouths and talk about it. And just do the research. I think, you know, and you can, there, it's there and you know, you're looking around the room. There are people that are here too. And yeah. the fact that you are here is important and you can meet other people that are doing things you were at black house you know the people that are there and what I'm finding there's a collectiveness um, there's Latinx house that's here as well indigenous house. I mean like this indigenous so there's yeah. a, this is our time you know so it's no longer we don't have the the luxury of saying, oh, we don't have any people. There aren't any people that's that are... That's what I'm saying. Concept. That's why, like, we're, we're here. We're here. And also, like, Instagram, yeah. Facebook, the Twitter. Like, I'm a, and I'm old. Like, y'all are millennials. You look like that. You know what I mean? Like, you guys are really connected. <laughs> All right. Another question. Paula. I love her question. There's a microphone right behind, behind you. Behind there you she go. always serves. Nice. So, um, so in the context of shouldering the future, I'm looking... Um, mine's going to be about intentionalism. Or intentionality. How's that? Yeah. Um, so this question of finding opportunities for young Asian P API males to have prominent roles. Uh, and I'm going to back into this a little bit. The last I looked, uh, the number one demographic committing um, suicide on college campuses were Asians. Um, the number one demographic being bullied in schools, whether public or private, Asians. And so I, I wonder about the option we have of how we are presenting Asian youth in our projects. OK, so here comes the tough part. And before I say this, I just want to acknowledge that I'm part Chinese. Um, for many generations, immigrants from Asia saw as a partial success if their daughters married white men. Okay, that was a partial success for some. Controversial, I know, but true nevertheless. And as we saw in a very moving way um, in the Joy Luck Club, how this woman pretty much decimated her own personality in order to support the husband who was a Caucasian, who then said to her, oh, but you lost your passion, and that's really why I fell in love with you. And then she said, get out. I don't want you anymore. I mean, it, it turned into a whole thing. What I'm getting at here is in shouldering the future, do we feel a responsibility to keep in mind those statistics that I just cited and understand that while in the spirit of creativity, we might want to present and cast an Asian young man or Asian young woman in a certain way, or do we have a responsibility to be mindful of how all of this is playing out with how they are depicted and demeaned in general media? And do we as content creators of color, and in this case I'll talk specifically about Asian, uh, Asian Americans, do we not have a responsibility to be mindful of that and push hard? Now, when I was running whatever I was running over at NBC, I said to the creatives in the room, I will consider myself to have been successful when you all cast a young Asian male as a romantic lead. And they were like, what? And I said, China is the most populous nation on the planet. 
Somebody over there is doing the do. <laughs> and my Chinese grandfather had not one, but two black women with whom he had children. So somebody was finding him hot. So what I'm, <laughs> what I, what I'm getting at here, and I know it's a soliloquy, but what I'm getting at here is in the shouldering the future, do we not think that in the creativity, we have to also address what's happening socially and sociologically to our people because they're still not seeing themselves in positive ways and are being bullied and alienated in their academic settings. Heck yeah, I'm sorry, I'll just be really clear. I personally feel, and I will say we have a game changer feel, absolutely and unequivocally we have a responsibility. The images that we see are things that, are, that influence conversation and influences culture, and I think that we have a responsibility for that. And I think that, um, you know, I, 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 it's like absolutely that that's what we should be doing. But I also want to just stick to a bit is that we need to finance and put our resources toward the filmmakers and the voices that show this. I think that right now we're dealing with, I'll just be real, systematic, I just talked about systematic racism, ableism, homophobia, you know, all of that. That's what we're dealing with right now. And we're trying to stop that, you know, that system and shift that perception. And the way that we do that is being able to uphold new storytellers with our resources and financing. We're out there, and that's what I'm saying, like I, I keep getting stuck on the same thing. Our stories are out there. There are people out there that would do, that have these stories. It's just that we're sort of listening to, you know, the dominant culture that is saying that we're not you know that we're not bankable, but we also know that that's also bullshit because they also know that inclusion and diversity are the biggest money makers right now. So I think that we can also flip the script. And I know that like, you know, you got, you're a big servicer of, and financier of movies and you're gonna get all of our movies made. Yeah. <laughs> um, so with that, can you talk yeah. about your, your, your new role over at Game Changer? What sure. does that mean? I mean, it was great when we saw the, um, Press release come out and your face was everywhere. And it was I was like, "Mom, I give a talk." Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, I mean, Game Changer Films is a film finance and television development company, and one of the things that we believe and that we're standing by is that the diversity of our content needs to be as diverse as our investor pool. You know, I think that so that's one of the things that's very important for us because there's quite a few people out there now that are saying we're making movies for people with disabilities or t content, disabilities, LGBTQ, um, women and people of color. But we need to go that one step further and that's what we're prepared to do with Game Changer Films. And we've known each other a really long time and I just wanna give us a little bit of context. I've been an independent producer for a very long time. I've done like over 23 films, 153 pieces of digital content and a network series. Right, like I have a lot of experience, but you know it was, and my movies have won awards. Real Women Have Curves, National Registry, Dear White People, now it's on Netflix. You know, we've done a lot, but you know what's been consistent? Is that we've had to go and beg over and over and over again the stories that we know are bankable, the stories that we know that win the awards at Sundance. It's like we're starting fresh all the time, and that's unacceptable because there's no way for us, and I'm saying us as a people, that's all of us being, um, we're not gonna be able to make the change that we need until we pull our resources together and stop siloing ourselves off. Like, I love all these houses that we have. I love all of it, but we can be different, celebrate our differences and be together, and by us coming together financially, <laughs> that's a big one, financially, that is the way that we're gonna be able to change the face of Hollywood. And that's what we're doing. And I've been trying to do that for quite some time. And I got to the point where like, I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted. And then put the plan together, met with the game changer folks who were like, oh, that's great that you're raising your own fund. Would you ever run somebody else's? Yes. You know? <laughs> yes, I would. <laughs> and that, and it's, 
And I'm so excited because I finally get to write the check. I finally get to be like, I know you've been out here struggling for so long. Like, you know, I'm sorry, I'm trying, I'm preaching again, but like, I know you've been out here struggling for so long, and I know that you have talent. You just need someone to bank on you. You know what I mean? You see someone to bank on you, and they're like, oh, anyway, and that's, anyway, I can go on and on. I get really passionate about it, and that's what we're going to be able to do at Game Changer, where even the company, like the company, the people that are part of Game Changer, is reflective of the people that were looking to amplify their voices. Because as you guys also know, when you go and I'm grateful that Netflix, although like, you know what I mean? Netflix is good. Y'all are getting better. Y'all have a lot of black folks. Um, you know, I'll just be real about it. I'm just with love in my heart. Um, but a lot of times I'm not mad at you. It's true. You know There's what I mean? There's always room to grow. There's, oh, look at her. She is positive and I need to take a lesson from her executive diplomacy because I'm still a little, she has that. She is on fire. I'm like, yes, sister, yes. <laughs> See, I lost my train of thought. That's how good you were. Oh, but <laughs> She's all like, shut that down. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. So what's the process like to reach you guys? What are, what are you looking for? I mean, how do people, like, bring things to you? Well, actually... I think she's in the audience is Jennifer Kushner, my chief content officer. And I love my assistant, Sean. There she is. There she is. There you go. My assistant's like, no, she's not. There she, um, she's our chief content officer, and she's going to be the one that's going to be the first filter for the content that we're doing. But like, also, I know a lot of you guys. You just got my email and just let me know. Um, but we're looking for television series, um, and we're also looking for films as well. So that's it's a pretty simple process. But I will be clear. Let me just be let me just say the things that we're not going to do. <laughs> we're not, don't send me anything. You know, we're not doing black poverty porn. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We're not doing films where, you know, the woman becomes whole when she gets the guy. You know what I mean? We're not doing any of those things. We're not doing, I know they said, I'm not doing, we call it like a kill your, what do you say? How do you say it? Bury your queers. We're not doing, no, I'm just saying, but like, we're not doing shit like that. I'm not trying to do anything that has those, stereotypes and tropes that have been done to death. I'm not interested, so don't send me anything like that. We're looking for things that are reflective of society, but like can also is cutting edge, and that can also create that cultural conversation. So we're, I mean, it's, it's, I'm really, really excited. And I'm looking to have a formal partnership with Netflix. <laughs> As game, we know game show, I'm like, and I think that Cam can facilitate that, and then you can do all our movies, although you're very expensive. <laughs> there you go, like, I don't really know. I was like, well, you know, there you go. I'm like, but they got money. They can hire us. There you go. <laughs> well, talk about money. Um, I just use my name. But I think, you know, for to, to have youth voices, one of the video, I mean, a documentary I love from Cam was uh, AKA Don Bonus. I think what's really important is really support, not the people who went to film school already, not people in the field, but really catch them when they're really young before they have the opportunity, the high school, the teenagers, I think we need to support workshop, community workshop, to really yeah. give them the tools so they can see the possibility, tell their own stories. You know, I think that that's my, 100%. yes. And that's what money needed to support them. If we don't bank on us, who is? And, and I think that's always been the key, even within the Asian American community. Has always been because we know we've got like what's the highest, uh, you know, money coming through, and you know, with all the internet folks out in Silicon Valley, and I know some people are trying to get that. It's like that always is that question: when, when can we as a community start to support our artists and support those stories? Right. I don't have the answer to that, but it, that's always seemed to be that hurdle that we have within our own community, and I don't know if it's going to be that one person that steps out that decides to do that. I know there's someone in here that's on the board for CAM. I think Naja is like one of the yeah, ones that's leading. Naja's here. She's also one of the co-founders of Game Changer. And she's leading the way on that way. I mean, so it'd be, it'd be great if we were able to get even more people that could really look at funding these stories. Because it's like you said, you get tired of begging. We get tired of begging, yeah. but and also like financial independence is what changes things. And another thing, and I don't know, this is more of a comment than anything else, but a lot of times, when you have like films that are culturally specific, I look at and I say, well, who's profiting off of them? Mm -hmm. Is it one of us? Or are we being used as a tool 
right? Are we just using our stories as a way to make a dollar? And that's also why it's so important for us to be able to financially come to the table, but also be able to financially take that profit and be able to leverage that into other projects. And that's how we build our library. Right. And that's how we build our equity right. in our careers and in our companies. That's why I like looking at what macro is doing. Yeah. What he's doing over there and you know, he's not one of the, you, you know, you meet folks in the industry. Charles and, is lovely. And yeah. Charles, he's like not walking into a room boasting. No. And we know who those people are that come in boasting and they never like put me. their right. money where their mouth is. But, <laughs> I'm like, what do you think? But saying, like, dude? he's just there and he's like, judge me by what I put out. 100%. You know, and he. And and he's I, incredibly, sorry, just like, and yeah, just speaking, yeah, like giving exactly. him praise. He's incredibly collaborative. Yes. And he's also, he's someone that I like about him. He doesn't necessarily talk about it, no. he is about it, right? right? You know, he has hentified. Yeah. He has like, he definitely takes all of those, you know, um, silos and puts them all under one house. But I will say, and I, you know, that we also have, there can be more than just one. But. Do you well, know what I mean? So, yeah. and I feel, yeah. and that's one of the things. And I'll keep going back to Game Changer. Yeah. I can go to Netflix. I can go. Like we, it it takes all of us. Yeah. yeah. And I just have to say, I hope that he doesn't mind me telling this story. But Charles King was an agent at William Morris yeah. when right. I was working right. there, and in his office, he had a framed photo of his rejection letter from William Morris. And I just, I was so moved by that because we are all gonna get closed doors in our faces and we will more than they will. So keep pushing forward. And that is something, that's how there is more than one. Right. So and you they, need to be just, resilient, you need to be strong, you need to believe in what you're doing. 100%. And they're looking for so much different content from different filmmakers. I think they just finished doing something with Justin Chan. Yeah. That he supports, so that he had met up here like two years ago, I think, after, I forget which film it was that Justin had had up here. So they just finished filming with that. So I look at him, I look at someone like that's in our own community, like Nina Yang Bon Jovi. Okay, okay. Nina Yang Bon Jovi is one of our advisors, and she's yes. amazing. And so she and Forrest Whitaker set significant, up the production Significant exactly. productions, totally. And with them, what they're doing, and someone, someone said like, oh, well, they only work in black film. I said, no, take a look. No, that's You're taking a, that little, their stories that you know are gonna to have to come through. But I, you know, when you look at what they do and they're not well, wearing it on their sleeve, like they're not beating their chest, but those are the people that we in this room need to really know because they are looking for our stories and they'll be the ones that can, can do that. What I like is that they're putting their money where their mouth is and hopefully that will encourage other people to do that so that we're not always having to celebrate the two or three. Exactly. So it becomes the norm. And I look at what they're doing over at Array and what she's trying to do with everything and be with distribution slash. Now she's got a movie theater in her, in her right, place. Right, but I love that. I think that And she can exhibit. It's all about exhibition. Where else are we going to, you know? And then because she's in historic Filipino town, she's like, okay, let's collaborate. And so it's, it's all about that. And I, you know, I think it's, and that's important. That's why I said I look at 2020 as clear vision. Looking forward, we have all you know. We can look backwards to where we are, but it's looking at the future. What we can create, what you guys can create here. Question over here. Thank you. My name is Simon Bright. I had a film here last year called Knockdown House. Yes. Uh, yes. Challenging institutions yes. out um, and creating more diversity. And my question, and I want to thank everyone for coming to this panel for Candy putting it on, and also uh, for inviting Effie. Because I think what we're, what I've observed is there's not enough intersectionality yeah. of experience. And the amount of experience and history that a black community has gone through, the mud that they've had to, the treacherous path that they've had to take, can inform all the actions of subsequent POC, subsequent immigrant communities. So this is a huge learning experience. Thank you for that. My question is, in regards to discussions of diversity and inclusion, those are areas in which we, we have a lot of uh, there's a lot of value signals. There's a lot of words in front of that. But it seems to me that the discussion stops when we talk about equity. The discussion stops when we're, who is invited to those rooms to have a seat at the table? The question stops when you're a POC and you're trying to determine your own sense of value in a market that devalues your work. The equity, the diversity, the inclusion stops when as an actor on screen, you find out that you can get one fifth, one tenth of what your white colleagues want. And then you feel as if you can't speak up when these moments of personal feelings of injustice are happening to you. 
for fear of the repercussions, for fear of the power structure. The power structure that much like society reflects those same incongruencies, those same yeah. disproportions, right? Like in US Congress, 80% white male. That's what we were trying to challenge with AOC record. Mm -hmm. So what can we do now to challenge Hollywood structure that is 90% white male control? <laughs> Just 90? You sure it's not more? Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I can definitely answer that, but I, I feel like I've been talking, oh, don't you don't care? Okay. Well, I mean, like, she's like this, she's all like, I don't know, I'm a cutting, I'm good. Um, <laughs> uh, just really quickly, and I just came from doing uh, the producer's brunch where I talk about, I did the keynote for it, where I talk about this. I mean, clearly what we need to do is we have to hire, mentor, and invest, period. We have to hire each other. Right? We have to mentor each other if we're not quite there yet for that job. And like I kept saying before, we must invest in ourselves no matter what. That's what we need to do. And that we also need to, because there's some people, and I look, people that have some agency, right? People that um, have some power. People that are actually have decision-making capability. I think the response, and, and that, because we're not all, like, I'll say that we're not all struggling. Do you know what I mean? Like, we can actually do something, and that's on us, right? That's on us. And even if it's not, we can't, you can't personally invest in something, but you probably have resources. You probably have access to something, and that's your way of contributing. I'm telling you, I feel that we are actually having this. I think we're going to dismantle this system. I really feel, feel like we're going to be able to do it. But we're going to do it together. Like, I'm getting on a soap, but we're going to do it together. And I know once and it's going to terrify those power brokers when they see all of us coming together and to be like, you know what? You, me, let's get these people. And we all come up and be like, no more. We do not accept this anymore. And I think that's really exciting, but I also leave it in our hands too, because we're gonna kill this system, we're gonna dismantle it, but what are we gonna put in its place, mm. right? And that's what I'm saying is on us. Like, that's on us. Yeah. What you think? Oh, no, no. We're gonna have to wrap it, but I want, no, no, it's okay, because I think it's a good place to end, but what I want, I want each of you to have a last say, what parting things you want to share. Mm -hmm. I know, Gene, you guys had just finished up on the, uh, the Asian, American. Asian American, if you want to talk about that, but. Well, I really appreciate what you say. It really is about investing your own time and knowledge. It, when I don't have the money, I'm not, I'm, you know, I don't have the resources, <laughs> but yes, just really take on one person, identify that person you need to harbor through. And well, the Asian American is actually, I'm very excited. I'm one of the executive producer, and it's the first time we, the Asian Americans, are telling our own stories. Yeah. Like Leo Cheng is in the house. He's one of the producer. Grace Lee's here, and, and Gita Gambier. We telling our story. And what my hope is for this series is what I learned from Ice on the Prize. Mm -hmm. You know, six hour, a six part series, but many wonderful director took this, the stories and expanded into feature length. Stanley Nelson did a great job in many stories. And I just wish, we only have five hours for this Asian American story. I wish many of you would take that story and just really go to town, just make a, long, you know, make a feature film later, and that's just my hope for the future. When is that gonna be on? May 11th and 12th, two nights, is a big PBS event. That's yes. Right. Sharoon? You know, David and I were talking a little bit before the panel, and what I want to make sure that we do is we have a little bit of a moment right now. I remember coming up in this industry, and I was usually the only woman and the only person of color in those rooms, and I felt so isolated. Um, I want to make sure that this moment doesn't just stay a moment, but becomes a movement, that it opens the doors for a movement. And the way we do that is making sure that no one voice is isolated, um, working together. I have colleagues here from Netflix who really bolster me and make sure that I know my points are important and that we get them across and that we push those forward. So just build those networks and make sure that you keep up the good work. Is there, is there a project that you have come in that we need to be aware of? 
Sorry, what's up? Is there a project you have coming up that you want to share with us that we need to be aware of? Sure. I, there are so many, but To All the Boys is coming out uh, in two weeks. Again, February 12th, the Wednesday before Valentine's Day. So watch it. Have fun. <laughs> Thank you. And how about you? One last? I, I feel like I've said everything okay. that needs to be said. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm just grateful that you guys are here and that you were so receptive to it. And I hope that we can carry on the conversation. And I just have to say, I'm a super fan of yours. And I'm so <laughs> glad I just had to be like, and I'm really happy birthday. And I'm very excited <laughs> to be here with you. And I just want to end on, first of all, again, like I said at the beginning, I'm going to give Cam a shout out. 40 years of stories that move. <laughs> you know. What you guys are, what you're doing nationally has always continued. And Don has been there. We've no, Don and I have known each other like forever. We've been all you know, in the trenches, you know, doing these things forever. Um, again, it's so inspiring looking across the room and seeing all different faces. You know, uh, we see allies, we see Asian Pacifics, we see everybody that's here. And you guys are all here to create something or be part of this thing that we call the industry. You know, my background is in publicity and uh, marketing, and I do in the documentary world. That's where I live because I love that, and that's I have a job that I love. And the way I got started is really weird, because I'm one of the co-directors for the LA Asian Pacific Film uh, Film Festival, and through that, in 1999, one of the filmmakers called me that I had known is Greg Pak, and he said, "Hey, my girlfriend got nominated for Academy Award. Would you do our Oscar campaign?" And because I thought, "Oh, I can do that," I didn't, you know, I didn't know no better. I said, "Who's ever going to ask me again, right?" And I thought, I'll just figure it out. Long story short, she won. Mm -hmm. Took her the Oscars. She was, she was like the belle of the ball. HBO calls, and it was their movie. And Sheila Nevins had never come. She had been coming to the Oscars four years in a row. She kept losing. So that year, she didn't come, and then they won. So she calls me, and she goes, hey, would you come to, Santa, would you come to New York? We can fly you up. We can talk about you doing the, um, the PR for the television broadcast. And I thought, oh, I could do that, too. But I, so my background had always been like in, in like healthcare, and I was doing a lot of HIV/AIDS work, working with hospitals. And I was at Children's Hospital as an administrator. But I've always had this thing, for you know, for film. I was one of those people. I'm not a creator. I can't write. I can't shoot nothing. You know. But it's like I've always been that audience. I can go sit in a movie theater for hours, right? So when the opportunity came, and I just want to say this, I said yes, and I figured out a way to make it work. Now I fast forward to you know, 2020, and I'm having a ball. I'm doing work that I like to do. I'm do working with people here. I'm working in documentary, but it's all about bringing people through, is all I want to say, because we're trying to inspire others. I'm trying to find other, like, you know, Asian American boys or Latino boys that want to be in publicity, because that's not, they're never thinking that way. So I'm trying to find people that we're mentoring. So I mentored someone through uh, the, I'm also lucky to be, because I get to be one of the few Filipinos in the academy, so I said yes. Um, and it's all again, it's all about saying yes and being ready whenever you can say yes. I'm thinking like being in second grade, a Filipino boy in Stockton, California, watching the Academy Awards. My mother let me stay up. Now I go every year. I work the red carpet, so that's what I do. And it's, and it's one thing that if, and I just say this to all of you, you can do what you need to do and just do it, take the risk, because you, you will fail, but you will also succeed. And if you don't push the envelope, like you were saying, if we don't change the narrative, and at the time is now, because everyone's calling out what the old school is, with Me Too and those two, whatever, it's just, it's our time right now. So I want to say thank you for coming and showing up today, because by you showing up here, supporting all of us. And thank you to you guys sharing the time here with us too, because it's important. So have a great festival, support all of these projects. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, and thank you to all the panelists.